Have you been trying to get that smooth and sexy voiceover sound? Did someone tell you to compress your guitar because your picking is too sloppy? Did you read that the secret to that dude's bass tone is his magical secret compressor? Are your drums sounding too dry and boring, no matter how much you're layering them? What you need is a compressor. But you've used one and you can't really hear the difference. Is it even doing anything? And what do all these controls mean? What does anything mean? Is there any point? Does anything even matter? Welcome to Mix Signals. Relax. Today, all of your questions will be answered. Now, let's talk about compression. So why do we compress? Well, for a lot of reasons actually, both practical and also creative, but more on that later. The main reason we use compressors is in order to control and reduce the dynamic range of a signal. Dynamic range? Let's just define that real quick. In a recording, dynamic range is the difference in volume between its loudest parts and its quietest parts. This piano part, for instance, has a large dynamic range. This bad guitar riff doesn't. Now let's quickly demonstrate why we need compression and how we apply it by taking a look at this recording with a very large dynamic range. Here we are listening to someone playing the mix signals theme during a thunderstorm. Shh. Most of the music is of average loudness, somewhere around here. In the background, you can hear the rain, the echo of the room, and other ambient noises. Occasionally, very loud thunder occurs. Now, if we want to be able to comfortably listen to the music, we should probably raise the volume a bit. The problem though is that if we raise the volume of the entire recording, we're also raising the volume of the thunder, which is already too loud. Even worse, the thunder can become so loud that our system won't be able to handle its volume and it will end up being distorted. So then, the solution is to lower the volume of the recording, but only when the thunder occurs. By doing this, we've made the loud parts of the recording quieter and brought them closer to the average volume of the recording. This is called compression. After we've compressed the signal, we can safely increase its volume so that now the music is loud and clear and the thunder is not overwhelming anymore. As a side effect, we've also made the rain and the other ambiance louder as well, but this is the price we have to pay. That's it. That's compression. It really is that simple. All a compressor does is automatically lower the volume of a signal when that signal gets too loud. By doing this, it allows us to turn up the volume of the entire signal afterwards, which makes it sound louder overall. So somehow, counterintuitively, a compressor makes sounds seem louder by making the loudest parts quieter. Where it becomes a bit more involved though, is in the way we instruct the compressor to turn the volume down. Do we want it to turn the volume down a lot or a little bit? How fast do we want it to turn the volume down when the signal gets too loud? And how fast should it turn the volume back up when the signal is not loud anymore? And most importantly, how loud does the signal have to be for the compressor to start working? The first and most important control in any compressor is the threshold. This is the level above which a compressor starts compressing. If the threshold is high, then the compressor will only act on very large peaks. With a lower threshold, the compressor will be compressing more often. Now, the amount of compression is adjusted using the ratio control. At a ratio of 1 to 1, the compressor is not working at all. At 2 to 1, the portion of the signal exceeding the threshold will be halved. So, for instance, if a signal is 12 decibels louder than the threshold, now it will be 6 decibels louder after compression. Similarly, at 4 to 1, a signal that exceeds the threshold by 12 decibels will now only be 3 decibels louder. 
At 6 to 1, the same signal will be 2 decibels louder. As you can imagine, as the ratio increases, the compressor is effectively squashing the signal as close to the threshold level as possible. Compression at very high ratios, from 10 to 1 to infinity to 1, is usually referred to as limiting, and such a compressor can be called a limiter. Sometimes you might also come across compressors that have a knee control. This sets a range around the threshold level, where the ratio gradually increases from 1 to 1 to the chosen ratio setting. So signals closer to the threshold will not be compressed as hard as signals that exceed the threshold by a lot. This effectively makes the compressor respond less aggressively to smaller peaks and with full force to large ones, which results in a more transparent and natural sound. Aggressive compressors that trigger immediately when the threshold is crossed are called hard knee compressors. And conversely, smoother compressors that gradually raise their compression ratio the louder the signal becomes are called soft knee compressors. The last two controls that can be found on most compressors are the controls of its time constants. The time that it takes for the compressor to turn down the volume when it's detected a loud signal is called the attack time. Similarly, the time that it takes for the compressor to raise the volume back to a normal level when the signal is back below the threshold is called the release time. Adjusting the attack and release times on a compressor greatly influences its sound, and completely different settings will be required depending on your sound source and what you're trying to achieve with compression. This is the main skill you have to master if you want to become better at using a compressor, and we'll show you quite a few examples later, so you can start getting the hang of it and become better at hearing the compressor working with different attack and release settings. Finally, most compressors have a meter that shows you in real time the number of dBs that the incoming signal is being reduced by. This is called a gain reduction meter, and it can be your best friend when you're a beginner and you're trying to understand when the compressor is working and what it's doing to your signal. It's a super useful visual aid when trying to fine tune the strength of the compression and the attack and release times. Also, by knowing the amount of gain reduction the compressor is applying to your signal, you can then raise the signal after it's being compressed with an equal amount of makeup gain. This is how you boost your signal after compression so that it sounds louder overall. That's it for the theory. Now let's discuss some scenarios where compression would be useful and see how we can tweak all these settings on a compressor to get the desired effect. So this is the point where you want to put on a pair of headphones or turn up your very nice monitors and listen along with me. So let's try setting up a compressor to deal with something very common, vocals. Here we have an operatic scat interpretation of the mixed signals theme. <laughs> Obviously, its dynamic range is pretty large, so let's try setting the threshold slightly above the quietest parts in order to tame those ugly peaks. We'll use some slow attack and release times so that the compressor turns on and off gradually and doesn't become extremely noticeable when it's working. If we try compressing with a 2 to 1 ratio, we end up with about 6 decibels of gain reduction in the loud parts. So we can now raise the volume 6 decibels as well. We can try upping the ratio to 10 to 1, which gives us closer to 15 decibels of gain reduction, but also notice that it makes the noise floor much more prominent, especially if we raise the volume more. Have a listen again, and pay close attention to the quiet parts at the beginning and end of the sample, and how much more audible they are now that we've reduced the overall dynamic range. The uncompressed original? With 2 to 1 compression? And with 10 to 1 compression. Now let's try an example where we want to tame some peaks. Have a listen to this piano and pay attention to how loud the attack of each chord is.
can probably feel that your ear mostly focuses on the chord's attack and kind of loses interest in the sustain part because of the volume difference between the attack and the sustain. So let's set the threshold accordingly and compress with a ratio of 4 to 1. The aim here is to set the time constants of the compressor so that we only catch those specific peaks. So we need a very fast attack time and a fast release as well so that the compressor doesn't keep compressing during the sustain of the piano chords. Let's listen again. The uncompressed piano. And the compressed piano. You can hear that the chords now sound much more even, rich, and lively. In this next example, we have a kind of thin and funky electric guitar. Just like with the piano, we can try similar compression settings in order to tame some of those picking transients, so that when we raise the volume afterwards, we can hear more of the sustain and the body of the guitar sound. Wow, it immediately sounds much fatter. We can also try something completely different. We can lower the threshold even more and try to squash the sustain part of the sound, but make the attack longer so that the picking transient comes through even more prominently. Notice how this one sounds much less dull, especially for the chords, now that we've kept the transients. So here's the original guitar part. This is with less picking transients. And with more picking transients. Now let's look at an example where we can use compression for a more creative effect. Listen to this basic drum groove. It's pretty boring. In this case, we want to introduce some movement and some dynamic variation to the groove. What we want to do is compress pretty hard when the kick and snare are hitting, so that the right cymbal disappears and then gradually ease off the compression until the next time they hit, so that the cymbal reappears in the background. This gives the recording a breathing or pumping quality. So we set up the compressor with a low threshold and a high ratio. And also we set a slow attack time because we want the transients of the kick and the snare to go through uncompressed before the compressor slams down on the ride. Now the trick is in synchronizing the release time with the tempo of the song. If the release is too fast, we get this. But if we set the release so that the compressor stops compressing just before the next kick hits, we get this very bouncy pumping sound. So here's the original. And here's the compressed one. But wait, what if we were to slam this harder with another fast compressor on top? That sounds interesting. Compressing and then compressing again, but differently? Well, that's a story for another time. Well, now that you know what to listen for and you've learned the basic concepts of compression, it's time for you to go ahead and start compressing stuff. Use the stock compressor in your door or the simple stomp compressor on your pedal board and start experimenting with settings. Remember, compression isn't an effect that is immediately obvious and a lot of the time, less is definitely more. An overcompressed signal can sound lifeless, dull, and boring. So take your time to familiarize yourself with the sound of different sources when they're compressed. Listen to people's voices on podcasts and videos. Listen to vocals on different genres of music. 
listen to various instruments being compressed, like funky guitars or pop piano chords or heavy roomy drums. Pay attention to the way dynamics are handled next time you watch a movie, and try to hear how super compressed shows and ads are on TV. And then, most importantly, before you consider compressing, try to ask yourself, why am I doing this? What do I want to achieve? Am I chasing peaks? Am I evening out the signal? Or maybe both? Am I trying to shape the sound in a different way? Do I want to highlight details that are not very prominent in the original? And finally, is the compressed sound actually better than the original? Or is it just louder? Very basic questions I know, but answering them will help you decide when to use a compressor and how to use a compressor. If you can't answer though, then probably you don't need to start compressing in the first place. So wait, earlier I said there are more creative reasons for compressing. Well, this video is called The Simple Guide to Compression. But if you're ready for more compression techniques, like controlling compressors with external signals, mixing dry and compressed signals together, compressing lots of channels together, and you want to learn about specific types of compressors like optical compressors, VCA compressors, FET compressors, very mu compressors, multi-band compressors, and all the compressors, then let us know in the comments and we'll make this a video series. So this is the end of the simple guide to compression. If you have any questions, feel free to comment down below and we'll try to get to them. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe because that really, really helps us. And hopefully see you next time on Mixed Signals. Bye-bye.